Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. Today we are joined by Matthew Binko, Training Manager at Phoenix Data Systems, who's kindly standing in for our original presenter, Jeremy Fortune, who unfortunately can't be with us today. So thank you, Matthew, for your time. Uh, Webinar Wednesday, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Phoenix Data Systems. Phoenix is committed to offering the finest CMS software, service and support available in the industry. The AIMS 3 software is powerful yet flexible to improve operational efficiency and has evolved by listening to and collaborating with their customers. Their annual AIMS user conference is one of their primary ways they achieve this exchange of ideas. Phoenix is dedicated to the continued development of their AIMS 3 platform. So for more information, please visit goaims.com. And just a quick reminder to save the date for our full MD Expo. We are headed to the Carib Royal Hotel in Orlando, Florida from October the 29th to the 31st. So please join us for three days of education, networking and the latest advances in medical technology products and services. Registration is now open. So for more details, please visit mdexpo.com. Sorry. Okay, today's webinar is eligible for one CE credit from the ACI, and you can attain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey, which will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit, and you'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving away one of our Webinar Wednesday t-shirts to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. June is National Adopt a Cat Month. What is the name of the orange tabby cat who appeared in a comic strip and has his own movies? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard and I'll reveal the answer at the end of the webinar. We'll wrap up today's presentation with a live Q&A, so please submit your question anytime using the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, our presenter today is Matthew Binko, and he will be discussing implementing a CMS solution for multiple departments, best practices and challenges. Matthew, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, and by the way, with that trivia question, I think I know the answer. You got me hankering for lasagna now. Uh, again, my name is Matthew Binko. I'm the manager of training here at Phoenix Data Systems. Maybe a few of you have run into me here at Phoenix or at a uh, previous company. I've uh, dealt with multiple CMMS. Um, I love it. It's a passion of mine. Uh, and I've been in the healthcare industry for more than 20 years, was the head of security for a couple of major medical centers down here in South Florida. Uh, been a consultant for eight years, been with Phoenix for two of them. And uh, I hope to see each and every one of you down the road, whether it's at an MD Expo or at our uh, user forum in November. Uh, today, as she said, we're going to be talking about implementing a CMMS solution for multiple service departments. And to me, that's a topic that really isn't covered that much because each service department seems to go their own way for um, their CMMS solution. Some prefer uh, some software because it's really good with time, others because it happens to be better with preventative maintenance schedules, so on and so forth. But there are a lot of good key advantages to bringing in all of the service or some of the service departments into a CMMS. So when I talk about a service department, I'm talking about those that are providing the service, clinical engineering or biomed, facilities or plan ops, environmental security, so on and so forth and uh, like i said there's a lot of good <clears throat> benefits to having them all on the, the same uh, cmms for example it can help provide cost savings instead of everybody going out and spending money on their own software solutions uh, there is some cost savings by bringing it all under one umbrella since you're having a single you know, hosting cost, uh, as well as 
uh, you can base your licensures, maybe not on service departments, but on facilities or for users. And you may realize some cost savings there. It can also help with better reporting because usually if you're with a large organization with a lot of facilities, um, or if you're just a single hospital with multiple service departments, usually the higher ups want to see apples to apples with the reporting. Uh, so if you have multiple CMMS, it is possible that you have different codes, different settings, you know, different ways of collecting information, plus the reports look different. So all being under the same umbrella can help with that reporting. You can also provide better communication. How many times have uh, you been in your service department, let's say it's clinical engineering, and you receive a work order for IT? You know, how easy is it to get that information for that work order, number one, out of your pool of work orders and into that other service department? Um, or if you have a shared work order, such as uh, someone's pushing a laundry cart down a hallway and they knock an AED off the wall, right? Usually that takes two service departments to finish that work order. You have facilities who needs to rehang that uh, container for the AED. And then you have Biomed that needs to test the AED, make sure it's still in good working order. And if you have two different CMMS, you know, lining that up and getting it done um, in a timely manner can be difficult. So everybody being on the same CMMS can ab absolutely benefit uh, in w situations like that. And then it can also provide better workflows. Um, it can have service departments uh, use the same work order entry system. And they could also use the same way they communicate back to the requester. So it all looks similar, not the same, but it all looks similar. That way, if a nurse goes to one request page, they're gonna have to learn how to enter the work order that way. And then if they go to a whole different software suite to do a work order for a whole, for a different service department, then unfortunately, Excuse me. Uh, it can cause some consternation with the hospital staff. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. The three areas I really wanted to focus on today dealt with codifying workflows, meaning um, get it really getting in there and talking about what each department does. That's incredibly important since a lot of the settings within the CMMS may depend on how each department goes about their job. Do you require time? Do you keep your PM schedules at the first of the month or do you also have floating events, stuff like that? We're gonna talk about creating a schedule, probably one of the more important uh, parts about implementing a CMMS simply because you don't want to bring every department on all at once. It could be very chaotic and um, it really doesn't apply or uh, it, do it doesn't allow for lessons learned. And so uh, if one service department goes live and they operate that software for a little bit, they can pass on anything that they learn new about the software before the other department goes live. And then you also have customizing settings and data managers. That provides a lot of consternation with different customers because some settings are global and some settings can be set per department. For those global settings, who's gonna be the final say when it comes to deciding what has to be done in the software? Do you have to put time in? You have to complete all the tasks of a PM in the software in order to close a work order. Can you close a work order if 
the equipment is considered down? All these are example questions that customers have really fought with. And um, there's no easy answer, but the correct answer is if the software works for you. And as it says at the bottom, you can maximize the benefits of the right CMMS solution and improve your efficiency and reliability when it works for all departments. But one of the most important tools you're going to need when you do um, implement multiple departments is a tiebreaker. And some people will say, well, that's going to be the director. Maybe not. And that's because the tiebreaker should really be someone who absolutely positively knows all of the workflows of the departments. And it could be an admin assistant because they're doing all the reporting, they're doing all the time entry, stuff like that. Uh, it could be a senior technician or it could be a, a lower manager, but it's incredibly important where when everyone's fighting over settings and workflows and schedules and stuff like that, that you do have a one point of contact that can just step in and say, okay, I can see none of this is getting decided on. I'm going to make the decision and I say it's this. So having that person is incredibly, incredibly important. Now, I've done many multi-department uh, go lives, and it also can be modified to where every time I say service de department, I'm also talking about facilities because you have some gigantic hospital systems out there that cover states, right? Uh, just last year, I brought an entire country on Ames 3. And it was exciting, and I got to go see a whole new place. It was amazing. Uh, but it's not easy because even if you consider it being a single system, when I did that country, I was asking them, you know, how standardized are your procedures? Because at one part of the country, they would um, PM an Alaris 8100 one way. And I'd ask, when I went to a different city, is this how you PM that Alaris 8100? And they'd say, absolutely not. We do it a little bit different. And you would think to yourself, hmm, seems like they should at least do it similarly or the same. But that's the kind of disconnect you can have when you're uh, talking about workflows and uh, settings and that kind of um, information. Uh, so it really helps to really spend the proper amount of time when you're trying to implement this. And time is gonna be your enemy because uh, there are times when you'll get a customer that says, hey, we're about to lose our license on this other software in six months and we wanna bring four service departments on your software by the end of the year or something like that. Um, and they think that we could just stop everything and pick up and do whatever they need. Uh, we're going to do our best, absolutely, positively, but um, time is a major factor when it comes to um, implementing these systems. Now, if you're a technician on the call, you might be saying, man, this is boring. Why do I need to know any of this stuff? <clears throat> and I get you. However, sometimes it's good to know how the hot dog is made. You know, while you're sitting there waiting for your new software to come online, right? To understand why it's taken so long, what decisions are made, and what people are doing in the background. And I hope to shed some light on that as we go forward. All right, so let's talk about codifying workflows. And this isn't just for the CMMS to know how you do what you do. But a lot of times it's good to know for you to understand how you do things. Because a lot of times when I interact with customers, I'll say, well, why do you do it this way? And they'll say, well, that's the way we always did it. And I'll tell you what, if you, there's a sentence, whether it was from my time in the army or right now, that really irks me, it's because that's the way we've always done it. Nothing kills 
morale, nothing kills efficiency or anything like that, like those words. So going through your workflows absolutely positively helps to understand why you do it. Do you need to do it? For example, you'll look at some of the codes in some of the, uh, these customer systems, like they'll have 17 different work order statuses. And I'll say, why did why haven't you deleted some of these? And they're like, well, they've always been there and that's how we're working. And nobody wants to make that decision on cleaning those up. But <clears throat> understanding how you do what you do will absolutely affect the go live schedule. Number one, we need to make sure that the data we have in the system can support what you want to do. What's going to trigger a failed PM or a fa uh, corrective maintenance work order on a failed PM? Stuff like that. In addition to that, it could mean that we have additional training for those going forward. Because if we significantly change your workflows, we meaning both of us, the CMMS company or Phoenix, as well as uh, your organization, then that's going to cause the need for additional training. How are we going to uh, work? Maybe someone decides, let's start using a the purchasing module or the contracts module. You may not have, have the need as a technician to know how to build those, but you'll have to know how to read them. And if you encounter a work order where a piece of equipment is on a contract, what do you do? So it's gonna require additional training. <clears throat> Plus, and I cannot stress this enough, if you're halfway sleeping, please be aware of this one. As you're testing the system, because when you're a customer with uh, Phoenix, as you're going through the go live process, and as long as you're a customer with Phoenix, you're always gonna have a test site. And so it's always good, especially during the go live um, or the implementation phase, that you really kick those tires. You go into that software and you say, if I wanted to, I don't know, put vendor time on a work order. How easy is that? Or is it not, right? Is it meeting my purchasing needs? Is it meeting my contracting needs? Because you may get to a point to where you're looking at the software and going, hmm, we may want to delay this go live simply because the software isn't up to snuff. And that's happened. And it'll always happen because we always get more and more increasingly complex customers and we love it because when we're done taking them live, our software is that much better from listening to their ideas and implementing them. It also helps with training. And why I'm saying that is that you can customize the training and training documents for each department. And when you uh, create these artifacts, whether it's Phoenix that's creating them or whether it's your organization that's creating them, you can use them in the future. You can use them for new hire. You can use them for remedial training if someone's not doing their job exactly how it should be. Plus, you also have the that to add to your standard operating procedure. So if you have a joint commission inspection or DNV or whatever, and they say, how do your technicians know to do it this way? You can break out those artifacts and say, this is what we discovered during our go live process. And these are, and this is, this is what they're expected to do. Another reason why you want to codify those workflows is that it is, uh, aids in creating a list of deliverables. And deliverables, a lot of people say, well, that's what the software company needs to have in their system before they go live. But it's also what you, the client, needs to have in order to go live. We need you to uh, verify this data by a certain time. We need you to verify uh, the functionality 
by a certain time. And um, just as much as the client holds us to our deliverables, it's the same us to you. So codifying workflows is an incredibly important part. And it can take a considerable amount of time depending on the size of the customer. And I encourage you to um, ask whatever software you're thinking about going with, are you going to invest the time to figure out what we do and how we do it before we go live to make sure that this software works for us? In addition to codifying workflows, you also have to create that schedule and you want to make sure that that schedule can be accomplished. Because like I said before, we've gotten customers that said, hey, our license expires with this other software within X amount of months and we need to go live. And it puts an incredible amount of pressure on everybody, not just us, but on the client's uh, personnel as well. The departments should go live at an even pace and those dates should be communicated up and down the entire ladder during the go live process. That way people aren't always asking when are we going live and why do I have to do it by this time? Stuff like that. An advantage of spacing it out like that is allowing lessons to be learned. Usually it's the more complex departments that go live first and they really scrutinize the software and they really put it through it, put, put it through its paces. And at that point, by the time they're done using it for a week or two, they've amassed a pretty good amount of questions or comments regarding the software. And those questions and comments can be passed along to the next service department that goes live. A representative from all departments should be included throughout each implementation. And I say that because even if you're the last department to go live, if you're there for every other department, you know exactly how yours is going to go. And if you're the first department to go through, and you're still there for the last department, you can offer that knowledge that you've gained to those departments and re reassure them and be their uh, point of contact for the organization. It's incredibly helpful for everyone to be involved at all times. But the implementation process does not end at the go live. We love to do post go, go live Q and A's. So if you've ever bought a car, I doubt you sat there in the dealer's parking lot and read that owner's manual cover to cover and then decided to drive the car. Heck no, you always jump in, take off. After a couple of weeks, you're like, hmm, I wonder what this button really does. And then you crack out the owner's manual. That's what the post go live. Q&A is for. We let you test drive the software, let you get through it, and then after a couple of weeks after you've discovered what questions you do have, then we have that Q&A. We insist on after action reviews so that not only can we figure out what went right and wrong for you, we can figure out what we could have possibly done better to make that implementation process smoother or easier for your staff. And then finally, we do a transfer to tech support. We don't just dump you off. We're gonna call our tech support. We're gonna introduce you to one of our fine representatives and um, pass you off so that you have an opening relationship that when you finally call into our tech support, they're not strangers. They know exactly who you are. So a good example of a schedule would look something like this. In this example, we're taking three service departments live, clinical engineering, plan operations, and environmental services. I've got them all color-coded green 
blue and orange. Let's call it orange. So about three months prior, we're gonna start working with that first service department. We're gonna be talking about workflows. We're gonna be talking about settings. And we're going to analyze your data and probably do a first conversion, do a first crack at it. And during the coming months, We'll have you test the software. We'll have you look at your data, how it looks like in Ames 3, make sure it works for you. And then about a week before the go live, we'll conduct administrator training. That way they know exactly how the program works. And we can set it up to their specifications. We'll do a final conversion and a data review. And then we'll do the technician in the go live in the same week but we haven't forgotten about the other service departments you'll notice about two months prior we'll start the process with plan one month prior we'll start with environmental services however once we've done the go live for the one then we're going to start the administrator training for the next because we don't want to start confusing things and uh, we want to be able to um, apply all of our resources to that go live and that technician training and then it'll start all over again with that administrator training and then after a couple of weeks we'll have that post go live in the aar for the first one and we'll transition and it'll continue with our plan ops doing the exact same thing and then we'll start with environmental services we'll do the same thing and then once they transition the tech support, we're going to apply the lessons learned across the board to include us and then any artifacts that are promised we deliver at the end there. And that's usually what a typical schedule, maybe not to the day, right? Three months prior and stuff like that. Sometimes they take considerably longer, sometimes they take less, but this is an example of the timeline of what it would look like to go live. All right. After we've created that schedule, or probably at around the same time too, and by the way, I didn't put these three in any particular order except alphabetical because they're all pretty much just as important as the last. Um, whether it's the workflows, doing the settings and data managers or the schedule schedules. Now, when it comes to the settings and data managers, and by when I'm saying data managers, I'm talking about the codes that live in the system. So I'm talking about if you go into say a work order and you have various statuses or various work order types, right? cost centers, all of that. Those are what I'm talking about as far as data managers. But you have to discuss the settings, which ones are global and which ones can be per department. Because sometimes the global settings can be deal breakers. Now, in my example, we're taking to sit or plan, plan ops live, we're taking clinical engineering live, and we're also taking environmental services and when you talk about a global setting such as requiring time right for clinical engineering they love to record time right plan ops i'm about 80 20 not wanting time a lot of times plan operations they just want to say that they completed the work order and that's all they care about a lot of organizations forget that as much as this is a tool for management, it's a tool for everybody. Because if you monetize your work, then it'll show how much money they're investing or wasting doing certain workflows, right? If I have a $1,200 piece of equipment and last year I spent $3,000 keeping it running, now I have an argument to replacing that piece of equipment. But some Software says say that 
time has to be required globally or not required globally. So plan operations would have to say, yikes, if we're gonna put uh, time on all these work orders, it's gonna expand our time within the program. But here at Ames, we do everything we can to keep you out of our software. As ironic as that, as that may sound, um, we, we do our best. So what I mean by that, I had one client that said, absolutely not. We're not putting in time. It takes too long. And so I'll show them. I'll say, if I go into a work order and I apply labor, notice it comes up with my name and everything else filled in for me. All I got to do is put in a response, say that I finished the work order and hit save. It's that easy. Just a few couple of clicks. Incredibly, incredible, incredibly easy, right? So when they see that it really doesn't take that much more time in their workflow, then they say, you know what? Maybe we should start putting in time, right? So there's going to be some give and take. Some, uh, some departments will have to say, you know what? We can live with that. Sometimes they'll say we can't. And it's all going back to what the software can do, what you're willing to do with your workflows, et cetera. And here's where that tiebreaker comes in. Remember earlier I said it helps when you have that one person that will sit there and say, you know what, you guys have been quarreling about this for three weeks. I'm saying that we're putting in time or we're not requiring time. Because at times, it's the difference between a software problem and a personnel problem. We make great software and we can solve a lot of software problems, but if it's a personnel problem with just people not putting in time, well, you can develop programs uh, to find out who's not putting in time and then maybe doing some corrective actions. The physical hierarchy, that always can cause problems as well. Because if we're all in the same hospital, the hospital doesn't change physically from department to department. If I gotta go to exam room two and fix a leaky faucet, that's the same exam room one that Biomed has to go to to fix the C arm, right? So where this turns into problems is that plant operations needs to go to the roof. Biomed does not. Plan operations need to go into mechanical rooms. They need to go into mezzanine levels and such. And so you have to ask yourself, do we want to share these physical locations? In the same way that the cost centers and responsible centers aren't going to change, right? And all of these can be shared. It also helps to share nomenclatures, what you call things, right? And then we can create what we call assignment profiles to go against the different employees. That way we can sequester you in clinical engineering or in plant operations. So you don't see clinical engineering stuff, no matter how hard you try. You'll see the responses that were tailored to your department so on and so forth, as well as your employee settings, as well as security levels. Now, the way I recommend doing all this as you're doing workflows is by simply creating your codes in an Excel spreadsheet. This is one of the artifacts I was talking about because here's where you can decide such as work order statuses. Do we call it active? Do we call it in progress? Because it sure would be confusing if you had both open and in progress. Which one do you choose? Which one is for your service department? So a lot of times it's just a matter of people saying, you know what, for 27 years we've called it in progress, but if we have to, we can call it active. 
no problem, right? And then you just go through all of the different data managers, agreeing on priorities, work order types, which one each service department will use, trades. This is a big one because with biomeds, there really are no trades like there are in facilities. Facilities has carpenter, painter, electrician, so on and so forth. Probably the best use of the trade field I've seen by biomeds is BMET 1, BMET 2, BMET 3, stuff like that. A lot of organizations, they don't even want to see these. So you have to ask the people developing your software, am I going to have to see as a biomed carpenter and painter and stuff like that? In Ames, we can um, block those from clinical engineering. We also have work order responses. Um, we also have failures. Um, a lot of times we just recommend the Amy suggested, the 14 that they suggest, as well as labor rates, equipment types, equipment statuses, classifications, stuff like that. Is it active? At what point do you want to hold your PMs? If it's in storage, do you want to hold those PMs? Uh, or do you still want to PM those? So on and so forth. And this is a great, great artifact for anyone that might have to administer your CMMS. This gives them a starting point. This uh, tells them what's been agreed upon in the past and how it should go forward. Along with that tiebreaker, I also encourage organizations, if they're large enough, to have a CMMS committee. And you don't have to meet daily or weekly or anything like that, but maybe once a quarter where uh, you come together and you say, okay, uh, we have this work order status and we think that it should be split into two. Maybe you had on hold as a work order status and now you wanna split it between awaiting parts and awaiting vendor. You know, who thinks that's a good idea? How bad would it affect the workflows, so on and so forth. So, um, very, very useful going forward. And then finally, you have to decide how to set up your request portals because you really don't want to share one because clinical engineering, most of the time, will require that they put in a tag number, right? because most of their work orders are based off of that. Plan ops, not so much. Plan ops is like, I got a leaky toilet or a clogged toilet. I need something hung. I need furniture moved. We got a spill or something like that. Uh, when I say spill, I mean like a advanced spill, not water. Um, so it's good to have separate pages. For example, I've created a couple. We have our Ames EasyNet request page. We can put certain instructions on there. We can make it clear who this is for. We can require certain fields, right? Such as phone number, but maybe you don't require email. You have facility building and free text location. You can always put in a piece of equipment. It'll fill a lot of stuff in just like that. But facilities, may need something somewhat different. So it does help to make them look similar. You'll notice that this is almost the same, but instead of clinical engineering in blue, I got facilities in purple. I don't offer the ability to add a tag number because they don't need it, but you'll notice that my locations are a, a little bit more in depth, right? and I can keep going and going and going and going, right? Whereas clinical engineering, you're gonna get your location based off of your equipment. So you really don't need that much information. I could customize the instructions to facilities a little bit different than I had to with clinical engineering. I can put additional instructions and do uh, dynamic 
actions with the text to really get their attention. And developing these pages are important ahead of time because it goes back to the workflow. Are we going to have to send out a how to to the whole organization staff so they know how to submit a work order? Or can we simply put a link to it up here saying for instructions on how to complete this page, click here. No one uh, ever has the same answer, so it seems. So it's important to develop those workflows so you can develop those artifacts and get them out to the hospital staff. All right. So what we talked about, we talked about codifying the workflows, making sure you know exactly what uh, each department needs to do in order to complete their work within a CMMS or AIMS 3. We also talked about creating that schedule, why it's important, why it's important to space them out and not do too much at the same time. We also talked about customizing the settings and the data managers and why that's so important. Coming up in November, we have our user group that uh, we invite all of our customers and anyone else who wants to attend, learn more about AIMS 3, what it can do for you, let you get one-on-one -on -one with developers as well as our upper management to see what great things we have coming down the pike. I want to thank each and every one of you for showing up. Again, my name is Matthew Binko. I'm the manager of training. If you have any questions, go ahead and email uh, that email address there. You can always learn more about our product by going to goaims.com. And then if you need a contact sales or support, uh, we have our 800 number down at the bottom. Uh, they are in Detroit. I am in sunny South Florida. So unfortunately, you will not get me at that number, but they can surely put you in contact with me. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. I hope you got a lot out of it. If you want to discuss more about it, go ahead and reach out and I would love to discuss it with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. I've got a few questions that have actually come in. Um, one of the questions is, is there a limit to the number of service departments that can be on the AIMS 3 platform? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We can do as many service departments as you want. And we do offer um, neat functionality to where if you need to put equipment into multiple service departments, uh, for example, uh, we have a customer where the clinical engineering PMs the beds, but it's the facilities that fixes the beds. So that equipment needs to be seen in multiple service departments. And as you can see here, I can put them in every single service department if I wanted to. Great question. Hey, another one if you, is, how does AIMS 3 process hospital, hospital staff submitting WOs for multiple service departments? Okay, um, we can do it one of two ways. We have a single easy net page where they could go to and they can choose their service department uh, and submit work orders that way. Uh, that process tends to lead to some confusion. I don't recommend it. Uh, the only reason I would recommend it is if your administrative uh, support um, doesn't, is it, doesn't allow for someone to really monitor it. Um, so I always encourage creating separate pages. Um, there's no extra cost or anything like that, but uh, creating a page per service department. Good question. Another one here is, um, what happens in AIMS 3 if hospital staff send the clinical engineering department a WO meant to go to facilities? Can I reroute WO to the correct service department? Yes, you can redirect that to a service department. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. If you can see both service departments, it's just as easy as changing the service department from facilities to clinical engineering, hitting save, and it goes along its merry way. 
However, there's a lot of times where the clinical technicians can't see the um, same work or same departments as say facilities or EVS. And in our system, we have something called automation. And in this automation, I can program to where if I submit a war or if I save a work order, say against a specific person or team, say the clinical engineering team or the facilities team, it'll automatically flip that service department from facilities to clinical or vice versa. A lot of different ways we can do it. We're also developing a button to go next to service department, which will make it even more easy, where if you click that button, it'll bring up a list of service departments. You choose that service department and it'll just send it over. So we got a lot of great and exciting uh, enhancements coming or already in our system to help you with that. Okay, one more question here. Is there a preferred order for service departments should go live? Uh, normally, it's whoever paid for it. Because uh, a lot of times um, that department will say, hey, I paid for it, so I get to go first. But I usually like to bring in the service department that's really going to use it most. And I say that because they're going to, kick the heck out of those tires. And by the time the next service department comes on, they're gonna say, hey, make sure you do this or make sure you watch out for that, so on and so forth. So I usually like for those more advanced users to come on first. Okay, great. Uh, well, we don't appear to have any more questions, so Matthew will wrap up. So thank you so much, Matthew, for your time today and uh, for a great and informative presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit today's sponsor to learn more about the products they provide for the industry. So please visit goaims.com. As promised, the answer to today's trivia question is Garfield. So congratulations to our winner, Laura Kroger. Just a quick reminder, you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar, and you must complete the survey to receive your one CE credit from the ACI. You'll be able to download the certificate directly from your computer once you've submitted the survey. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We'll be back soon with another webinar, so please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you have a happy 4th of July from all of us here at Tech Nation and MD Publishing.